Okay, so today is the last day and this is the last session of our school uh, workshop. So, and our first speaker today is uh, Tina Ulrich. So, Tina, you are welcome. Okay, thank you, uh, Volodya, for this uh, introduction. And I also would like to express uh, my positive surprise about uh, the reactions on this workshop. So many people participate here and there are a lot of discussions. So it's it's really nice. It's uh, like it was intended to be. And um, hopefully also the younger people get some new, I don't know, insights, ideas, and more important contacts to other people to collaborate or discuss things. So it's, it's really nice. Uh, so my talk is about uh, the thing which we discussed maybe the whole week already. So I could use this talk for summarizing a bit what uh, what was discussed and what is what are the new maybe directions in that. So um, and in particular, um, I would like to maybe give you some idea what is actually this Kettison Singer problem and how is it connected to uh, the things uh, which we uh, use here and which are important for us. So in that sense, I hope that um, I can transport some ideas, but I will not get too much into this very technical subject. So, oh, something is happening. Yeah. Uh, some results uh, which I will present in this uh, talk are based on joint work with Nicolas and uh, Martin. I think both are in the audience. Um, but I will also mention and comment on some other results uh, where people from Chemnitz are involved. So um, yeah, it's, it's a broad topic in that sense and many different um, projects. So let me start with the, with the introduction, what is actually um, happening in this uh, talk. And uh, by the way, a technical thing, I will make some break, say after 45, 50 minutes. And then at four o'clock, we may restart and I will give the second part. Okay, as we have seen um, a lot in, in this workshop is uh, the following problem to solve. We have a finite dimensional subspace, which is spanned by a system. And for convenience, it is an orthonormal system with respect to a measure. Do you see my, my hand here, this pointer? Yes. Okay, very good. Yes, yes, we do. So it's spanned by, by this orthonormal system. It's uh, a subspace in L2, and this measure here plays a particular role. Um, here, right in the beginning, we have this measure for defining uh, the L2 space and the orthonormality of the system. But later, this measure will also play a role uh, for uh, sampling in the sense of draw random points uh, from a certain distribution. Okay, so and the goal is um, that we have a function in that space and we want to stably um, and if it's from the space exact recover only by using n function values. So, and uh, as we have seen also several times in this workshop, the whole thing boils down to solving a linear system. So, and usually here, uh, this linear system, I mean, uh, you see it straightforwardly that you plug in the sample nodes into the basis functions. So in the first line, there will be all the basis function functions taken at the point x1. And in the last line, all the basis functions taken at the point xn. So when we are looking for a coefficient vector such that matrix times vector equals this vector of function values. So, and usually, and this <clears throat> has been also pointed out by several people, um, we have here an overdetermined system. So we have more samples than dimension of the space. This is at least um, an assumption, at least, uh, yeah, it should be like that. Otherwise, this does not make sense. So, and the question is, first of all, what are the good nodes for doing that? 
And the second, how many of them do we need? And if I speak in the sequel of oversampling, I mean actually this ratio between number of samples and dimension of the space or so number of basis functions. So and in other words, we ask for when is the system matrix well conditioned in order to recover that uh, coefficient vector stably from uh, these function values. So we have learned a lot about weighted least squares. I will uh, put some names on the next slide uh, of people who are involved in that field and who kind of um, coined it a lot. We have seen change of measure technique. And um, I think Mario also mentioned important sampling. So all, all these things will also play a role in, in this talk. And the second thing what we have probably already noted is if these functions EDA1 to EDA M are nice, like trigonometric monomials, so the Fourier system, for instance, or Chebyshev polynomials, then it is a, a rather easy, say, to recover um, a function in, in this space. Yeah, since this coefficient matrix has then a nice structure, which we will also call bounded orthonormal system. And this also connects to uh, Nikolsky inequality and things like that, what other people mentioned in their talks. Okay, um, let me spend another slide for this uh, finite dimensional setting, because this is uh, interesting for many, many people. So um, many authors studied like recovering polynomials algebraic trigonometric polynomials from samples. And here's a, lot, a list of people. Also some people from Chemnitz are listed here. Then since they're, they are mainly uh, concerned with this trigonometric polynomial thing. And they also establish not only say a good, uh, good sample sets, they only uh, also establish fast algorithms. So this is another point and here I would also like to refer to Mark Ivan, uh, Mark Ivan's talk on Wednesday where he also was interested in uh, not only the complexity theoretic question also the uh, computational point. So things get complicated when it comes to the general situation that means we are just we just have given a finite dimensional subspace and we do not know anything Maybe we know that there is a certain Nikolsky inequality, but in the most general situation, the things get really interesting. So in here, people like Albea, um, Giovanni, and others, Ben Adcock, are interested in that. And let me especially um, name here the collaborators of uh, Volodya in his recent papers. And all these people from, from the lab in Moscow, which um, are mainly present here in this workshop, since they actually consider this um, equivalent question of getting good Marcinkiewicz Sigmund inequalities. So if you look to this quantity, and I think um, this has also been pointed out by many speakers, then you see actually in case p equal two we have here a condition which can be rephrased in terms of frame theory. So if we go back to that linear system here, so then the lines of the system matrix, they form a proper frame. I will come to that. I will define this on the next slides um, in detail. So here we have the connection to the frame property, uh, to the uh, frame theory this um, problem is well posed if actually the system matrix um, has a certain finite frame structure. And this is also the point where uh, all of this connects somehow to this uh, Cattis and Singer stuff. And I will point it out uh, in some minutes. So, um, but actually my main focus in this talk will be on the infinite dimensional case. So I, 
I use uh, the finite dimensional setting more or less as a vehicle. Since if you want to recover functions from certain classes, uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces or other classes like Sobolev classes uh, where it is possible to take function values, then uh, it mostly boils down to solving the problem on a certain subspace where uh, most of the things happen or which con contributes most to the norm of that function. So in terms of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, this will be the subspace uh, spent by the first, um, say, m singular functions. Um, and the first m singular functions are ordered in terms of the decay of the singular values. So those are the important functions. And this is the important subspace. And therefore, um, the, one has to understand the finite dimensional situation first before coming to the infinite dimensional setting. But this will be the main uh, focus in this paper, uh, in this um, talk. So we have now, as I said, a function from some reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is determined over this kernel K. I will do that also in detail after this introduction part. And we want to recover this function F by only using N samples. And in the IBC community, this is what people call standard information. So we are only allowed to take function values at N samples. We are not allowed to take wavelet coefficients, Fourier coefficients, things like that, which are connected to inner products, only function values. So, but then if we take n function values in this rather um, infinite dimensional setting, we cannot expect to recover the function precisely. So, and therefore, people are interested in controlling such a worst case error. So in here, I would like to refer to uh, Erich Novak's, Mario Ulrich's talk, talks, where they introduced these concepts. So we are looking for actually the worst case error when approximating the function by a sampling operator, which only uses these n samples. And this is a particular case of approximating the function by a rank n operator. So, and therefore, um, say the nth singular value or the nth approximation number, I will come to that as well, serve as a lower benchmark for this quantity. And we're interested in the decay of this worst case error with respect to the class in the number n of samples. Okay, and I think this problem has been um, mentioned also by several other speakers. In information-based complexity, there is the central question of how well can we perform um, compared to general linear samples. So as I said, these general linear samples, just a second. These general linear samples um, are a particular case of, no, are the benchmark, the lower benchmark for this uh, quantity. So in the, this question, which is interesting in this context is always compute the sampling numbers, which is actually the optimal worst case error with respect to standard information versus the approximation number, which is the optimal worst case error with respect to linear information. Approximation numbers are usually smaller, but the question is, is there really a gap or can, yeah. So is there an intrinsic, uh, higher difficulty when restricting to samples instead of linear functionals. Okay, yeah, so this, just to, to clarify, this your operator SX. Yes. Is it a linear one or you don't make that assumption? In my case, I will use a linear. Yeah, because operator. in that case you can compare to approximation numbers. Otherwise- there, there, there are general results which actually say that in this uh, specific setting, it would not make a difference. Yeah. But yeah, if you move to other function classes and go away from the Silbert space setting, then it could make a difference. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when in the uh, last introductory introductory slide, let's say, I would like this 
this, uh, I would like to introduce this concept of what we call Weber subsampling. Albert would call that sparsification. I don't know, uh, Volodya uh, calls that uh, yet in a different way, but um, we call it subsampling because it refers actually to this Weber conjecture, which is uh, in connection to Kedison Singer theory. What happens here? So if we have, say, more samples than dimension, and usually this logarithmic oversampling serves very well, then um, there is a actually recent new technique to restrict to O of M many points from that initial cloud of samples, which perform equally well. So um, we usually have to have here a starting point cloud. If we choose this as random, we have a logarithmic oversampling. And if we choose it, say, for trigonometric polynomials deterministically, we could use rank one lattice construction. So we have a, say, m squared oversampling. So and it is possible, and this is the technique I want to um, mainly focus on in this talk, it is possible to reduce the sampling budget to O of M. And this goes back to, and this is what I think everybody has now learned in this workshop, that it somehow goes back to the Kettison Singer solution or Weaver's conjecture. There are several papers connected with it. Historically, that last one was uh, that, that paper from 2014 by Batson, Spielmann, Srivastava. Uh, was the first one in that row, but it did not solve the Kettison Singer problem. It, it is a slightly weaker result in that sense, but it turned out that for our purposes, it might also be um, sufficient. Nevertheless, in 2015, there was this breakthrough paper by Markus Spielmann Srivastava, where they actually solved um, a related conjecture namely Weaver's conjecture, which turned out to be equivalent to Caddison Singer, and that was actually proved by Weaver. So when these things have been further investigated by Nitsan, Olevsky, Ulanovsky, so and these are the papers which we have already seen in this talk, in this uh, conference a lot. And I will um, yet another, uh, I will also comment on that. And hopefully it gives some new insights here. So that is actually the introductory part of my talk. If you're further interested in that, then be with us. Otherwise, uh, yeah, that's what will happen. So you can leave if you want. But um, actually uh, the talk starts now. So this is a kind of outline. So um, this Caddison Singer problem and other things has have been uh, and things around have been mentioned a lot, but nobody actually told us what is the Caddison Singer problem so far. This is what I will do, and I will point out roughly the connection to uh, finite frames. Now, then we will come to this um, nice method by Nitzan, Olevsky, Ulanovsky, and further uh, variants of that in order to reduce the sampling budget. Yeah, and then um, I will introduce my model setting where to apply all this. Come here to, let's say, our favorite example, and then compare the outcome and give some outlook. Okay, let's uh, maybe dig a bit into this Kettis and Singer problem. But before doing that, and as I promised, I would like to point out the connection to finite frame theory. And I think this word or this notion frame has been used uh, a lot in this uh, conference already, or it, it has appeared. But let me maybe uh, define it here in a rigorous way. So on this slide, you have three notions. One is a notion of a Bessel sequence. The other one is the notion of a frame. And then we have the notion of a Ries sequence. So a Bessel sequence is actually a sequence in the Hilbert space. This is also always the, the set, the starting point. We are in the Hilbert space. And a, a sequence Fi, a discrete sequence in the Hilbert space is a Bessel sequence if we have 
kind of this Bessel inequality given with a constant C. So this is one part of the frame uh, definition. So in order to have a frame, we need two bounds here. We need a lower and an upper bound. So and this should immediately remind you on this um, masinkiewicz sigmund problem, where you actually have here in the middle the square sum over the function samples and left and right you have the integral norms. So and uh, in that sense, the system matrix perform uh, is is a, is a frame. So in this uh, in the sense of this definition, and the frame has the particular property that it is a redundant system. So it does not not have to be a basis. I'm sorry. So it does uh, it must it does not. So uh, a frame is a generating system. So the span of those elements in the Hilbert space uh, equal the, the, the closed, the closure of the span of a frame is the Hilbert space itself. You can see this immediately due to this lower condition here. It is not possible that there is an element that you have an element um, which does not equal zero and is orthogonal to all the frame elements. So a frame is not a basis, but it is, a, it is a redundant system and it spans the Hilbert space. In contrast to that, a Ries sequence or a Ries basis is a linear independent set of vectors where you have this uh, relation here. Is it clear um, to everybody? I mean, you can also ask in between. Okay, so this is actually the, the point here. Um, and let me now uh, come to something completely different, namely uh, the Kettison uh, Singer problem and its framework. So actually, this this problem is a is a problem from operator theory, and on the first glance, it does not have anything to do with finite frames, on the first glance, say. So it is motivated from uh, quantum mechanics, from the work of, of Dirac in 1947. And um, the framework is as follows. We consider the complex Hilbert space um, L2. Yeah, so the sequence space L2. And on that sequence space, we consider the space of bounded linear operators. So also clear. You can uh, picture that as an infinite matrix, say. Okay, and as a subset, of this set of bounded linear operators, you could um, consider the following C star subalgebra, namely the matrices, um, the diagonal matrices. So this is a, a subspace of the linear operators on this uh, L2. And now comes the, the important uh, point in this framework. We define the notion of a state and the state is actually a functional on such a diagonal matrix, on such a, a diagonal operator. So when this functional has two properties, namely uh, it has this normalization that the uh, unit matrix say is mapped to one. And if you have a positive operator, then this uh, state returns us a positive value. Yeah, so maybe you, you uh, look at this a minute more. I mean, we have here a Hilbert space. We have operators on a Hilbert space. On these operators on a Hilbert space, we define functionals. Okay, nevertheless, um, this state space or the set of all states in this uh, dual space, D prime, is convex. I mean, due to these two um, definitions here, you can immediately see that this is a convex set. So, and therefore it is the convex hull of its extreme points. So, and now um, these extreme points play a special role in that. They are called pure states and these states uh, can therefore not be written as a proper convex combination of at least two other states. So they are kind of an atom or pure state. Now, atom is maybe the wrong word. 
So we considered a set of pure states. Oops, and now the, the question, which was posed by Caddison and Singer, is the following, is this extension of a pure state unique? So actually, you can extend such a functional, of course, always due to Han Banach to, um, to a functional on the set of uh, bounded operators. So this is clear. But here the question is, if we have a pure state, is this extension unique? This is the Caddison Singer problem. And this is Excuse roughly, me, yeah? can I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, so B is really, you say the, uh, I mean, or D, uh, you're talking about diagonal operators. That is D. And B is the set of bounded operators. Yeah, so diagonal, what you call a diagonal operator is just a multiplier I want to understand. That's a diagonal matrix. So it means that it's just identified, it's, it's L2, so it's it just identified to an L infinity sequence. Exactly. Okay, so D is essentially like L infinity, okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, the question is, uh, when is that, is the extension of a pure state unique? That is the Caddison Singer problem. And actually the answer, surprisingly, or I don't know, surprisingly, so um, I mean, as often as I talk about this, I still do not have really a feeling about this operator theoretic question. So I cannot say if it's surprisingly yes or no, but it turned out that this answer is yes. So it is unique. And uh, um, Caddison th Singer theorem, what is now called Caddison Singer theorem, is actually this, now this assertion. And it goes back to the work of several people. Because um, the problem, like it is stated here, is usually not, um, is probably harder to tackle than considering equivalent formulations. And there is a whole slew of equivalent formulations in that. I could refer you to the work of Pete Casaza, for instance. So he uh, spent decades of his life to uh, kind of work in this field. So there are many different uh, characterizations. And one is the characterization by this Anderson's um, paving conjecture. And it was proved that this is equivalent to the um, Caddison Singer theorem. And Weaver proved that a certain conjecture which is now called Weaver conjecture is equivalent to Anderson's paving conjecture. And what Markus Spielmann, Srivastava in 2015 did is they proved kind of Weaver's conjecture. And then the chain rolled and uh, Caddison Singer was history in that sense. <clears throat> so when you see, if you want to, um, what I just said that this Anderson's paving conjecture is kind of a good tool for doing that if you want to show this uh, uniqueness, you actually need to show that uh, the extension of a, a pure say, a state is zero when evaluated on a self adjoint operator with zero diagonal. So we need to understand what does such a pure state do on a zero diagonal um, self adjoint operator. So, and as I said, this Anderson's paving conjecture was a nice, uh, was actually the, the door to it. So when it says, now it's not a conjecture anymore, now it's kind of, uh, it's proven. And it says the following, for any epsilon, there is an R such that for any self-adjoint matrix from C n by n, later we will also consider here infinite matrices with zero diagonal. As I just said, the zero diagonal um, matrices are here actually the, the interesting thing. There are coordinate projections um, which decompose the identity. Oh no, which decompose, uh, yeah, which decompose the identity. And then you consider this uh, concatenated operator. So you consider what make what happens with T on these coordinates. And the norm here should be small. Okay, this is a tough stuff. This is it for the for the first time, but imagine. Uh, you would have an, a self-adjoint operator with zero diagonal. If you would simply put um, the coordinate projections, which consists of just one coordinate, then you could decompose, of course, uh, or in, in, a, in a sense, then this norm would be always zero, right? So this condition would be fulfilled, but you have too many. 
So if you just admit one coordinate uh, projection here, a, co a projection to one coordinate, then you can, you can do that even with the norm zero here, but um, you need then n such projections. And this paving conjecture says that for any epsilon, there is a number r depending on epsilon such that this works. So, and um, yeah, this is uh, actually the point. So you have here projections themselves depend on t, but the interesting thing is that this number here can be really made precise. So there's really the dependence on, on epsilon here. And the point is this, uh, this then holds for all n. Exactly. So as I said here, this can be pulled up to infinite matrices. So this is not depending on n in that sense. And this is actually the, the point to, to go to Kettis and Singer. And um, as I said, there are many, many different formulations. This, there is this paving conjecture and there is this important Weaver KS2 conjecture, which is now important for what we have in mind. And there is also the uh, famous Feistinger conjecture. And the Feistinger conjecture says that, so he conjectured that at some point, that every frame can be decomposed in a finite union of free spaces. So at some point, Feistinger told us this story. Um, he came up with this question, but he was afraid that this question is trivial. So he didn't want uh, his name connected to this conjecture, but it turned out that it is actually not trivial. So it's really um, a tough question, equivalent to a, a tough uh, thing here. Okay. And now the question, what is actually the contribution of Markus spielmann Srivastava? So what did they prove? So they proved something on um, operator norms of sums of um, self-adjoint or sums of rank one matrices, which actually implied this Weber conjecture. So what they proved is the following, or this is actually a corollary of, of what, what they proved, but this is the, the, the main point here. So if you have uh, independent ran random vectors with finite support, so that means in every component of these random vectors, there can only happen finitely many different uh, numbers. So it's a kind of discrete, um, a discrete distribution in that sense. So if you know that in the mean, you have here, say a finite frame. So in, in the mean, this is the identity matrix and all these, um, all these vectors are bounded by epsilon. Then you have a positive probability that you can control the sum of these rank one matrices here in the spectral norm by this bound. So and, and this was actually the big breakthrough. I mean, uh, clearly you do not see from this how that implies all, all that other stuff. Um, but it is at least also remarkable from the fact that if you would use like random matrix theory, then um, actually you always end up with the extra logarithm in the dimension of this matrix here, right? So, and this does not happen here. So, but what you do actually is you trade um, the high probability, what you would get from random matrix theory to having only a positive probability or having one instance of these independent random vectors being bounded like that. So, and actually, this now leads us to the following. So you can now use as a, as a corollary, you can prove the following thing. If you have given now vectors from CN, no random vectors, just a fixed set of vectors, which are also bounded like that, and which um, are a tight frame. So this condition here means they are a tight frame. So then you can, uh, then there exists a partition into R sets such that the corresponding spectral norm of these of this subframe in a sense is bounded by this number. So this can be got out of this result here. And actually um, there are two things to mention. What you kind of uh, do is you use the components of this UI and put them, use them as the support of that random vectors 
And then you uh, apply somehow this uh, theorem here and you get this partition. So here's a probabilistic uh, ingredient involved. And this will also give us later um, the insight that all of these construction are, are non-constructive. It's just an existence result. And you see that uh, most clearly in this result here, it is proven only the existence of such a partition. So when now this famous Weaver conjecture actually refers to R equal two. So this is what we have seen in the, in the workshop several times that you can decompose a tight frame into two subframes with good properties. So here then R equal two. And this is this uh, famous Weaver KS2 conjecture, which will actually be the bridge to our function recovery problem. Let me see. Oh, it's already 36 minutes. Okay. So, um, and this Weaver conjecture, which is now proven by Markus spielmann schrivers tava technique. Um, by the way, I should mention that they used a very, very sophisticated technique in order to control these spectral norms here. What they actually did is really to compute the largest uh, zero of such a characteristic polynomial. So they used a technique called uh, mixed characteristic polynomials and kind of observed a certain structure in these zero uh, points of such a characteristic polynomial. So they really controlled the spectral norms by zeros of characteristic polynomials. Okay, and so this is now the, the, the central question for what we have in mind here, this Weaver's conjecture. So we have a, a tight frame and it is possible to decompose this tight frame into two parts. So in that previous theorem, R equals two, such that both parts separately are still a good frame. Yeah, so we start with a tight frame and we get two frames out of that, having frame bounds theor uh, theta and uh, eta, uh, theta minus, eta minus theta and theta. Um, and this is, as I said, an existence result. So, so far, there is no constructive way of getting that, which is one of the main uh, problems in, in all this, uh, which also opens some new research directions. So, and then there is this um, result by Nitsanolevsky Ulanovsky, which we have seen several times in the talk, in, this, in the talks in this workshop. They made it a bit more uh, explicit and produced this quantitative version. So if these vectors are smaller than epsilon, if we have a tight frame with frame bounds one, so then uh, these two subframes have frame bounds around one half. So a bit larger and a bit smaller than one half. So it's uh, in that sense, kind of two um, more or less equal uh, frames. So uh, this uh, result, let me see, something is wrong here. So, and with this result, we can now go to our recovery problem. So, um, as I said, we want to recover functions from finite dimension subspaces. And as I uh, said in the beginning, all of this boils down to this frame type question so we put in our basis functions the samples and ask whether this is a good frame or not. So, and um, now we need an initial good frame, preferably a tight frame, such that we can decompose this frame into two parts. But this thing with the tight frame is not, not that easy, but um, in some special situations, like for instance, if you consider trigonometric polynomials with frequencies in an index set, you can do that. You can do, um, you can get say the full tensor lattice or some rank one lattice, which is certainly a tight frame. And this is the starting point. Yeah, this is then the starting point here in that question. And um, this method or this um, result of Nitsa Nolevsky Ulanovsky has been iterated. And this is what we have also seen uh, a lot. Um, 
And I think in Russian literature, this is called Lunin's method to iterate this, um, this, this division process, so divide and conquer somehow. So you um, produce sim uh, smaller frames and at the end, you would end up with a hopefully small enough frame, which has still good bounds. So and this, is, uh, this was done. Um, as I said, you apply this, uh, this, this technique of dividing the frame iteratively. And then you end up with a frame which only has O of M, where M is the dimension, many elements. So the initial technique has been proposed by Nitzan Olevsky Ulanovsky. And then there are further versions of that. One version was presented by Limonova uh, in, in her talk, Irina Limonova. Um, and in our paper, we have this version here, which also generates, uh, generalizes this to get rid of the tight frame property. So let me say that this approach of uh, Limonova Temyakova, actually they were the first who um, kind of got rid of this equal, uh, of this identity here and got this. So, which, which will be important later on that there is an inequality here. So, and um, now for us and for our purpose, it is important that we have to start or that we may start with a non-tight frame because uh, the approach, what I propose is to first get a set of random nodes and later subsample these random nodes to O of dimension. So let me um, explain what happens here. So in this version, which is, uh, which is in our paper, um, we also got an explicit control on the constants. And so you see actually how this uh, iterated division of the frame kind of influences uh, the constants of this resulting frame. And what you see is here that K2, K3, and K1 are real numerical constants, like 3 half, 1 half, or 2, something like that. So when at the end, we end with a frame, which has here a lower frame bound yes. M, M divided by M. Sorry? Sorry? Um, Tino, can you comment also big, uh, what's the reason to iterate uh, the argument? I mean, what was uh, in the previous result? Uh, why wasn't that uh, enough? Which previous issue? Previous issue? Previous issue? So the uh, uh, Ulanovsky or Levsky uh, result you uh, two slides ago? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They they already, they already did this, did this procedure. I have here some. Yeah, there is, yeah, there is, there is kind of echo. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe if, if, if Stefan if Steph mutes himself, then there yeah. will be no echo. I think now, now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Nitsa Nolevsky Ulanovsky, they already um, introduced this procedure of iterating all this. Yeah. And they got actually a version of, of this, where you here have a tight frame and here equality. And this iterating procedure gives you at the end um, a resulting frame of the order or of, of the size O of M. If you just divide it once, then you get one part of the frame, which is half of the initial size. Is it clear, Stefan? So from, from Yes. Going from n to, to m needs a certain iteration. So you cannot uh, expect that you do that from, from one, one step. Okay. May I add a little bit, you know, the same, but basically answering the question of Stefan. Uh, because Nitsan, Olevsky, and Dulanovsky, they also used iterations. Uh, but in their assumption, that was very important that this norm, this UI norms, is equal to what is written on the right hand side. And also in their result, because they did not apply this for finite dimensional situation, they did not control 
uh, the cardinality of this set J. So this is what they did. Uh, but in the, in the later paper, what already uh, Tina mentioned that in the paper of Limonova and myself, uh, we uh, got rid of that equality of the norm. This is very important. Uh, but in the formulation, we still have this tight frame assumption, but the proof uh, is uh, in the proof is written. I mean, it's uh, the proof goes exactly like it is there uh, for just frame, not a tight frame. So that, that is uh, actually, uh, so this tight frame condition here is actually uh, important for our approach. So we generalized actually this, this thing to this tight frame condition in order to apply this two-step procedure and to, to get, uh, to, uh, can, can draw random points. Because if you draw random points and put it in your basis, you cannot expect to get a tight frame. So, and that is why this version was very convenient for us. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is why uh, we did not formulate this with a frame because we did not need that. But in the proof, it is that. I mean, we just proved this, this, uh, uh, this uh, frame assumption, not tight frame assumption. Yeah, but anyway, so this, oh, and this, the, and this, the this answers the Stefan's question, right? So what is, because Nitsan, Alevsky, Ulanovsky, they did have iterated uh, procedure, but uh, it was not as general as uh, we would like, as uh, Tina wants. So this is the point. And then the next steps, that means it was not uh, quite trivial, I would say. So there, that required some work. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tino. May, may I also have a small comment, Tino, or a question, by, by the way, because I had to, to check, and since we are discussing that, it's maybe a good point. Um, so the condition of being a frame where all the UI have equality here, right? I just opened the of Nitsan and so on, and they also have this equality thing here, inequality thing. So, so do you know this statement of, so they, they say that's an easy corollary of their theorem as no, corollary B, that's clearly not the iterated version. So can you yeah, comment? Yeah, this, not, this is not the iterated version. So with all in these- the iterated, Mario, in the iterated version, uh, they require equality and okay. the proof is based on that. This is what we can say. If you have but equality, if you have equality then you can immediately deduce that, that you have uh, kind of this, this cardinality. So nevertheless, there are different versions of this Nitsan Olevsky Ulanovsky uh, technique. And for us, it turned out that this is the uh, most convenient version. And in particular, we were able to control all those constants and track them kind of uh, yeah, you see how these initial constants influence uh, the frame bound. Okay, and let me maybe, um, yeah, I still have some like five minutes. So let me maybe um, tell you or make you aware how to apply it to the recovery problem. So what you actually do is you put your frame, you take the basis functions and plug in your nodes, right? So here you have these uh, frames, uh, you have the, the lines of this matrix are the um, elements of the frame. So, and if you plug random nodes there, then by a certain oversampling, which I come to, um, we will have that this is actually a good frame. And now comes the important point, if we are in a special situation, so if we are now dealing, not in especially if you are in a complete uh, general situation, we may do this change of measure technique, which I will comment on. And then we get here this bound on the frame elements, which is actually here in this finite dimension situation equal M over N. And therefore we can apply our result here to this thing. So we can apply this Weber theorem since we have now um, frame bounds, which can be arranged like this by choosing random points. 
And we can apply this Weber theorem and get a subset of, these, uh, of this index set of size O of M. And as we put here, we can even determine the precise size of this subset by this constant here. So and what you also see is this constant uh, so far, these constants are so far very, very high. So a very big constant and numerically not very feasible. And that is why um, it could make sense to use the technique from this Betzen Spielmann Schrivastava paper in order to do that. In order to, to do a similar thing here and get much better constants. So for this technique here, the constants are rather bad, but controllable. This is what I say here. Okay, and let me maybe explain this slide here before going to the break. So what, what, I, what I just, um, is there a question? Okay, what, what I just proposed was the following. We do a random draw, which has more points than the dimension of the space. And to this random draw, we apply the Weaver subsampling. And the first step is here um, a change of measure technique. So because this change of measure technique is needed in order to make this frame bounded so that every line of this frame is bounded by its dimension, say. So, and therefore we define this density function, which we have seen in several papers, like in Albea and Giovanni, and uh, Mario um, uh, in particular, because uh, he and David, he, they did a big progress in that for applying it to function spaces. So, and then with this technique, with this change of measure, we divide actually the frame elements uh, by this and then control the L2 norm of the frame elements. So, and then we do a random draw with respect to this new measure and this random draw gives us then a good initial frame to what we may apply the Weaver subsampling technique. Yeah, and then solve or our recovery problem uh, as a kind of weighted least squares problem. And we have seen several um, different characterizations or several different formulations of this weighted least squares problem. Let me formulate it like this. We have this diagonal matrix where you have one over this uh, density function applied to X1. And then instead of solving LM times C equals F, we solve this preconditioned system which has actually this good condition properties where you have the, uh, the nice uh, frame bounds and then we are on our way. So this is this three step procedure and therefore I call this talk also optimal subsampling of random information because this is the strategy what is here behind. So, and as I said, um, yeah, all this thing is actually connected to this, what we call Weaver subsampling. So, and I think um, we could do a short break. Would you like to answer questions if there are any? Tina. Yeah, of course you can do, I mean. Are there any questions or comments or remarks? I think I have a, a small remark regarding uh, Tino saying uh, he likes to have smaller constants. Uh, I'm with you and uh, I would say the goal should be a constant smaller than 20 uh, since otherwise replacing the logarithm by a constant does not be useful in, uh, in any problem you, you have on your computer. That is of course. Yeah. Other comments? That is of course completely correct. Yeah. Really. So in that Other sense, comments? Uh, for technical, for, for theoretical reasons, this is of course nice, but yeah. Absolutely agree. That's really, really nice, but uh, uh, there is some, a similar argument, uh, Drefessen once made about uh, Lebesgue constants and uh, 
And interpolation by polynomials. I mean, we all learn that numerical interpolation is so bad because the Lebesgue constant in certain situations grows logarithmically. But as soon as you have a bit of smoothness, um, this logarithmic term is does not play such a big role. And I would say here the similar situation is that um, if if the if this constant uh, uh, or if the sampling uh, has the logarithmic term and you you replace it, it really pays off if the if the constant is of course small enough. Yeah, that is a yeah. really good comment. But unfortunately, we are not yet at that stage. Yeah, uh, just to make it constants, you know, <laughs> is, uh, we are not just even going to have a So <laughs> this is this is the future. This is the future. Yeah. Other comments. Yeah, I, I will make question. Just uh, Can comment. I ask a question? Yes. Okay, so, go uh, ahead. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, I bet I can hear you. Yeah. So it's about this uh, this question of how how much we can spare to what point we can sparsify and get uh, uh, Marcinkiewicz Zygmunt uh, weighted uh, framing. Uh, let's say in L2, uh, so we can understand with this, uh, uh, with the other approach, Marcus Pilman, uh, Srivastava, we can go quite, uh, quite close to N. Uh, and so th there are now, if we particularize, we can give instances uh, of, of spaces. Uh, I can give you instances of finite dimensional space where we really have this, uh, where well, we can really have this Marcinkiewicz Zygmunt exactly with uh, with n point with the same number of point as the dimension. I can give a couple of instances. My question is: uh, is there I, is there a general result that says uh, for for general uh, for, there is no hope to have this for general spaces? That says it's necessarily has to be strictly larger than n. Do you uh, see my? Albert, what, yes. what, do you do you mean n in a sense of order? No, no. So, so sorry. What I call n, if there was a switch, uh, what I call n in my lecture was a dimension, and m is the number of points. Here, it's the other way around. So he has a space of dimension m uh, of yeah, right, right. Okay, my but question anyway, is: Are you talking, Albert? If you are talking about L two discretization, yes. So then there is a general theorem which is in our paper with Irina Limonova. Yes, yes. And it is based on Watson Spielman Srivastava or Marcus Spielman Srivastava, yes, yes. which says that for any general L two yes, yes. subspace. It is enough to have constant multiplied by n. No, I yes, then the constant is bigger. Now I'm saying, can do we need a constant? Can we have exactly n? That's what I ask. For general, because I can give instances of spaces. I can give you particular spaces like piecewise finite element space, piecewise where where it will be exactly the, the same number, and you will have this table discretization uh, exactly with the with the so it's like is there a miracle for certain spaces where you and 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 it's very explicit in that case what you should do and i'm saying is this do you think it's a necessity to have something strictly larger than n maybe maybe it's a very i i agree that this is not a <laughs> So, and there, maybe one comment from my side, depends what you mean by in general, because a nice example due to Erich um, that I also mentioned in yeah. my talk, not explicitly, is basically assume you have a class of function where somehow in the function values, the optimal coefficients are hidden. Somehow, you don't know that, right? But then an optimal algorithm based on function values is clearly as powerful as the best algorithm. Do you know? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, uh, Mario, Mario. That, Albert is talking just about discretization. There's no recovery. Just yeah, 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 I'm just yeah, but still, if you have a class of function where this is where this information class, is hidden, a subspace, any subspace. He wants to have this for any subspace. 
and uh, M is exactly dimension. Yeah, yes, and I can say that there is a subspace that can do that. Intuitively, I doubt that. Yeah, I think Bologna, you are with me. So, uh, okay, but but you see, you you agree that when we particularize, then we for first there are cases where we can have that. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there is some structure. There must be the question is what is the structure? For example, we know this is quite tied to inverse estimate, for example, but when we have smoothness, things like that in the space. Hmm? Anyway, okay, well, thank you. Uh, uh, no more should questions. We, should we maybe, continue? Maybe before we continue, uh, Gina, just not to forget, uh, one historical uh, remark about this change of measure, what you call change of measure. Uh, this exactly that kind of change of measure uh, is used in uh, finite dimensional Banach spaces. And it goes back to like uh, the mid of ages. And it is absolutely standard there and classical stuff. And in the same, for the same purpose. So you have a general subspace, which does not have good properties. You want to get a subspace with good properties. You make a change of density. They call this a change of density. So probably the first one who did this was Gideon Schechtman. And uh, then uh, it was used in the classical this paper of three authors, Burgen, Linden Strauss, and Milman. Uh, so this is the classical stuff in that area. And basically they're doing very close stuff. So just, just a remark. So that the change of density is a kind of classical technique. Okay, now uh, Tina is back to, to, to the work. So Tina, go ahead. <laughs> 